So at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Ajay, Dr. Mayur, and Dr. Shivendra. And instead of moving on to the topic, which is allocated to me, is diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And whenever we talk of diabetic peripheral neuropathy, pregabalin certainly comes to our mind because we prescribe it day in and day out. But today, what I'll be talking is beyond diabetic, uh, beyond pregabalin in the management of diabetic peripheral neuropathy. I'll briefly rush through the initial slides to set the context and just to recapitulate some basics about the diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Now, we know that diabetes is the most common cause of peripheral neuropathy, which accounts for nearly 32 to 53 percent of cases of peripheral neuropathy. We are also aware that diabetic peripheral neuropathy basically affects nearly 50 to 90 percent of our diabetic population. And this is one of the most common complications in diabetes, which ultimately also contributes to the development of diabetic foot. And we are also aware that diabetic foot is something which leads to amputation and once amputation is in picture, then there is a very high mortality to come in future. Briefly going to the pathogenesis of diabetic neuropathy, it roots to hyperglycemia and various processes involvement through the N6 fatty acid metabolism or the DAG or PKC activation, glycated products, oxidative stress, polyol pathways, and all this finally culminating into ATP depletion, nerve conduction velocity impairment, endoneural hypoxia, and the damage to the nerve endings. This is pictorically, we can see that there is occlusion of the vessa nervosum, and that leads to damage to the myelinated and the unmyelinated nerve fibers. Now, once we talk of a person with diabetes 20 years from the diagnosis, then we can see that only 10% of the patients, they are left without neuropathy. Rest 90%, 50% will be symptomatic and 40% will be asymptomatic diabetic neuropathic patients. Briefly touching the classification, we are all aware about sensory motor neuropathy, the autonomic neuropathy, the mononeuropathy, and the proximal neuropathy, how we divide diabetic neuropathy. The symptomatology will depend upon the type of the fibers they are involved, large fiber neuropathy or the proximal motor neuropathy and the acute neuropathy. Basically, it affects the motor functions more so than the sensory. But if the smaller fiber neuropathy is there, then we have more of sensory symptoms. The symptomatology, if we talk about then, there are positive symptoms or negative symptoms, the spontaneous pain, allodynia, hyperalgesia, dysesthesia, paresthesia, and the negative symptoms in form of hyperesthesia, anesthesia, hypoalgesia, and analgesia. How the patient comes to us, that depends upon the class of the nerve fibers involved. More so, they are the peripheral small fibers they are involved, and therefore, sensory motor neuropathy is something which is more common. The common symptoms with which the patient first comes to us are burning, lancelating, tingling, and shooting electric shock-like pain, where they are typically worse at night or when the person is tired or when the person is stressed. The, the things which we normally mention on our prescription is the hyperalgesia, which is the exaggerated response to painful stimuli, or allodynia, which is basically the sensation of pain that is uh, produced with a, uh, with a stimulus which is normally not capable of producing pain. If the pain is evoked by simple contact, then it is known as hyperesthesia. If the person is having unpleasant sensation of burning, that is dysesthesia or abnormal sensation that is paresthesia. The involvement of large fibers may cause numbness, tingling without pain and loss of protective sensation. Feet feel like they are wrapped in wool or person is walking on cotton and all this ultimately will interfere with the activities of daily life, disability, psychosocial impairment and overall quality of life of that individual. The common signs which we see in day-to-day -day practice, if the sensory neuropathy is there, dystrophic nails, callus formation, dry or cracked skin, sharp cord foot, if there is motor neuropathy, then muscle wasting, muscle weakness, claw toe. And if suppose more so commonly what we see sensory motor neuropathy in form of painless ulcerations, neuropathic edema, Charcot's arthropathy, callosities, etc. Many times we forget about this entity, this is the autonomic neuropathy and patients do come to us with symptoms like postural hypotension, gastroparesis, diabetic diarrhea, neuropathic bladder, erectile dysfunction, neuropathic edema, Charcot's arthropathy, so on and so forth. But this basically skips our attention because Many a times we don't think about it or many a times we don't have facilities to detect it. The diagnosis most often is the diagnosis of exclusion and principally it is a clinical one, a combination of typical symptomatology 
and symmetrical distal sensory loss or typical signs in the absence of symptoms in a patient with diabetes is highly suggestive of diabetic peripheral neuropathy. But many of the patients, nearly 50% of them, once we, we test them, they will not be able to pick diabetic neuropathy. So what are the common tests? We are all aware about the Tenji monofilament, which is the siemens winston filament for uh, knowing touch or the vibration sense using 128 hertz tuning fork or the other uh, test to check for the temperature and the other losses. But nowadays, we have uh, uh, devices which can test all of these in a very comprehensive manner and in very quick time, that is the neuro touch, and we don't miss on the testing part as far as the peripheral neuropathy is concerned. So these are the devices which can be used in day-to-day -day practice to detect diabetic neuropathy. If we talk of autonomic neuropathy, which is skips our attention, but once we have facilities, then we see that this is also not very uncommon. And But and certainly these facilities are not available in many of the centers. So what we need basically is something which can be used in our day-to-day -day practice, and that is the uh, neuropathic symptom score or neuropathy disability score, which can be used very easily in clinics. And they have got very high sensitivity and specificity to, to tune off nearly 90%. The management goals in case of painful diabetic neuropathy that we have to achieve at least 50% of pain relief. But we have to be realistic on this account. At the same time, we should also be setting the secondary goals like the changing the mood of the person, changing or improving the sleep pattern, the functionality of the patient if it is affected, that has to be improved and the overall quality of the life has to be addressed. We are aware that pigabellin is something which is prescribed very commonly, but what I'll be discussing now from here, nearly 10 minutes or so, will be what beyond pigabellin. So we have to, we can address various, at various spots in the pain uh, management pathway. And if we talk of the central pathway, then medications that can affect the central, uh, central sensitization like the alpha and the delta ligands, via the tricyclic antidepressants, tramadol or opioids, we can affect the descending modulation through the SNRIs, TCAs, tramadol, or opioids, or we can even address to the uh, the uh, the nerve terminals in form of uh, the local application of capsaicin, local anesthetics, or tricyclic antidepressants. At the same time, we can also stimulate the spinal cord. This is what I'll be try trying to talk. So we are aware that there are agents beyond pregabalin and gabapentin. They are duloxetine, topical capsaicin, tepentadol, amitriptyline, and vanilla vaccine. They can be used. And if I briefly touch upon these duloxetine and vanilla vaccine, they basically root through the increasing the activity of noradrenergic and the serotonic uh, neurons in the descending pathway of the dorsal horn cell. And these descending neurons inhibit the activity of dorsal horn neurons, suppressing excessive input, which is perceived as pain from reaching the brain. Duloxetine became the first agent approved by FDA in 2004. The dosage is 60 to 120 milligrams per day. And the common side effects are nausea, somnolence, hyperhidrosis, constipation, dry mouth, etc. Vanilla vaccine can be used in the dose of 150 to 225 milligrams. Practically similar side effects, excepting for hallucinations and increased heart rate, which can be additionally there. If we talk of tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline is the most commonly used tricyclic antidepressant because of the fact that it acts at more than one places in the pain pathway. And certainly, this is of use in addition to the first line drug. Dosages ranges from 10 milligram to 90 milligram per day. The adverse effects are the cholinergic side effects, which we are all aware about, and also the QTC prolongation, which we should take care of. If we talk of opioids, then all guidelines, they talk of avoiding their long-term use, but tepentadol is the only opioid specifically approved by FDA for the use in treating peripheral painful diabetic neuropathy. Tepentadol is a strong analgesic that combines the mechanism of an opioid receptor agonist and also the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And therefore, it is having dual mechanism of action and it is recommended, approved, and this is something which we use in our day-to-day -day practice. The dose stage is, is 200 to 500 milligrams per day. The normal adverse effects are nausea, vomiting, and dizziness. Topical capsaicin in 2020, the FDA approved capsaicin 8% topical patch for treating painful diabetic neuropathy. Topical capsaicin works via agonism of the transient receptor potential vanilloid 1 receptor, that is TRPV1, and topical exposure is thought to reduce the TRPV1 expression, nociceptive nerve endings in the affected area, providing period of pain relief lasting for several months. The other agents, there is a very nice uh, 
article which is uh, published uh, very recently that is the american association of neurologists guidelines subcommittee uh, recommendation and they have basically taken into cognizance all possible modalities to treat diabetic peripheral neuropathy and briefly to talk about carbamazepine maybe tried 200 to 600 milligrams bd l carnitine there are two rcts showing improvement in pain and nerve regeneration ala there are conflicting results sodium channel antagonist or blocker in form of lamotrigine that is 200 to 400 mg per day lecosamide 400 mg per day or sodium valproic acid in the dose of 1000 to 2000 1200 mg per day or 20 mg per kg per day or there can be a combination of valproic acid and glycerol trinitrate that can be used but the line is that if only partial efficacy is achieved adding a, uh, achieved with one agent then adding a second medication should be of different class that may provide a combined efficacy greater than that provided by each medication individually if we talk of the clinical evidence which is available there are numerous there are rcts which the double blinded trials which are talking of the positive uh, effect of all these agents in the management of painful diabetic neuropathy now coming on to something beyond the pharmacotherapy and that is the neuromodulation the international neuromodulation society defines neuromodulation as medical technologies that reversibly enhance or suppress nervous system activity with a goal of treating disease and in both implantable and non implantable devices that deliver electrical chemical or other agents so what are the neuromodulical therapies the neuromodulation therapies are intrathecal therapies transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation and spinal cord stimulation and more recently is the 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation which has been found to be useful there are a lot of evidences which are available which have tried as rcts as far as the efficacy is concerned and i'll talk briefly about all of them transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation tens is a non invasive inexpensive and easy to use form of neuromodulation to treat both acute and chronic pain with few contraindications and no known drug interactions patients treated with tens have electrical stimulation applied and then there is high frequency more than 50 hertz or low frequency less than 10 hertz of bursts which are given to the cutaneous stimulation the mechanism of course is not very well known but the hypothesis is that it can improve microcirculation higher levels of beta endorphins and meta enkephalins that increase expression of protein including calcitonin gene regulating protein and the nerve growth factor and reduce inflammation so do these mechanisms probably the tens gives that benefit talking about other modalities like low frequency pulsed electromagnetic field that is known as pemf or frequency modulated electromagnetic neural stimulation on its frames there is some data but the effects they are transient if we talk of intrathecal pain therapy then ziconotide or morphine is recommended and fda approved for chronic neuropathic pain such as associated with painful diabetic neuropathy so ziconotide is recommended more strongly by the polyanalgesic consensus conference also there is no tolerance or withdrawal and significantly less respiratory depression it is non opioid analgesic that binds selectively and reversibly to n type voltage sensitive calcium channels thereby blocking the release of pro nociceptive neurotransmitters in the spinal dorsal hot if we talk of the conventional spinal cord stimulation that it was first used in 1967 and it is being used since then but then there are lot of advances which have happened in this direction and if we talk of the effect then the mechanism is based on the gate control theory of melzek and wall and if we talk to the functional mri imaging then it has been shown that the activation of suprapsinal areas that modulate pain transmission in the dorsal horn by descending serotonergic and the noradrenergic projections the burst spinal cord stimulation unlike the conventional and the high frequency spinal cord uh, stimulation which deliver a stimulation at a constant or tonic frequency in this burst spinal cord stimulation it is characterized by clusters of high frequency pulses separated by the longer interpulse intervals and it is intended to emulate naturally occurring neuronal firing patterns there is a limited evidence but what we have something which is now having a very good out, uh, outcome is the time frequency uh, the, the high frequency 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation and if we talk of uh, the trial then the sensapan study which is a six months result of this study were presented in 2021 meetings in the north american neuromodulation society and it is uh, said to achieve the primary end point of 50% pain relief in 86% of the subjects so it, this is something which is being used 
Now, talking something about futuristic in the uh, in the diabetic peripheral neuropathy or the painful diabetic neuropathy, then that is the role of hepatocyte growth factors. So, if I uh, this is briefly discussed in uh, or published in uh, uh, in November 2021. If we talk of a snapshot on this product, then this is C DNA plasmid coding for human hepatocyte growth factor. It is given as intramuscular injection with angiogenic potential. The potential target is basically to prevent the development or progression of diabetic uh, neuropathy. There are phase C trials and extended trials of this. Hepatocyte growth factors basically is a multifunctional cytokine known to induce neurotrophic activities, including the enhancement of neuronal survival. And if we talk of this extension study, then there is a regeneration potential of this hepatocyte growth factor, which has been identified because patients, those who are expressing the, uh, or those who were given with this uh, hepatocyte growth factors, only two weeks following injection, but the pain relief was continued over a period of nearly eight months or more. And therefore, that gives that there is something which, uh, which uh, these factors, they do to the regeneration potential for these drugs. But if we talk of the uh, peripheral neuropathy, then we should not forget about the basic foot care education, which is part and parcel. We are all aware about it. And we have to remember that we have to take care of all these factors once we are talking or treating peripheral neuropathy in our patients. Thank you so much for your patient listening. And uh, I should compliment because we are witnessing the potential of young India through Hormone India. And I must compliment Dr. Mayur, Dr. Ajay, and Dr. Shivendra and team for their out of box thinking in creating this fantastic uh, conference. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Over to you once again.